Hello, I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to a special edition of Conversaciones con Al McFarland y con Carmen Robles. Uh, this is a wonderful collaboration. My friend and colleague Carmen Robles and I have been working together for a long time. And over the years, we've also discovered the importance and the opportunity to speak particularly to the Latino community, the Hispanic community, the Afro-descendientes, to talk about uh, the world and the emergence of this sector of our population. And one of the arenas of that conversation is the impact of the opioid crisis on the Latino Hispanic community. Well, today we're pleased to continue our discussions with experts in the field, uh, principally talking with the sheriff of uh, Ramsey County, a friend, a leader, a person with knowledge and with a commitment to serving uh, our populations, all of us. And we're glad uh, that uh, he is here, Sheriff Fletcher. Also in the conversation, our colleague, a national leader, Dr. Hector Colon. Uh, and Dr. Hector is gonna be uh, talking about the ongoing relationship he has in providing direction, leadership and service policy considerations uh, in the area of op opioid and substance abuse prevention. Uh, we're pleased to have the other Carmen uh, I mentioned Carmen Robles, but Carmen Moreno is here as well. Did I say it right, Carmen? Yes, you did. Car Carmen, Carmen Moreno, Moreno <laughs> right, from, from the Sheriff's Department. And um, uh, Carmen, so good to see you and thank you for your leadership. Uh, I know that you're on fire <laughs> in bringing this work, this message to the community. So I want to stop there and just turn it over to my colleague, uh, uh, Carmen. First, I'll say bienvenidos a todos. Y vamos a hablar uh, mucho de cosas importantes y hablando con un senso de tenemos, uh, ¿cómo se dice? Uh, contestas to the problems. We have the answers to the problems, and that's why we're here. Yes. Carmen, hola. Muchísimas gracias, uh, Mr. McFarland, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we continue our important conversation around a very uh, important subject that a CSO Moreno and I have been working on for the past year. Uh, at this time last year, uh, the Department of Human Services uh, had a, a supported a conference for Latino-based so that we could address uh, opioids, heroin, substance use disorders within our Latino community here in the state of Minnesota. And uh, we were so fortunate to have uh, our keynote speaker, which was uh, chosen by uh, folks over at Metropolitan State University who has, they have their, uh, their finger on the pulse of what's happening. And we were so fortunate to uh, get to the state of Minnesota, Dr. Hector Colon Rivera from Pennsylvania, originally from Puerto Rico, from the little island sister of Puerto Rico, Vieques that's even smaller than Puerto Rico. And so uh, not only did he come for that event and for that moment, but he has been with us the full year by our side here in Minnesota as we try and get to our community. No one would have guessed we were gonna have a, a global uh, pandemic. No one would have guessed that uh, we would have civil unrest and that the world would be turned upside down. Uh, I'm, our sheriff's office, uh, they deal in being prepared. So uh, they, they got on it. They, they did that preparedness thing with the COVID-19, getting teams out. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But right now I want to bring Dr. Colon Rivera into the conversation and introduce him to, uh, I'm very proud to introduce him to my sheriff in Ramsey County, uh, Bob Fletcher. And I'm very proud to introduce to you our mentor and colleague, Dr. Hector Colon Rivera. And so if Dr. Colon Rivera, if you could just please touch upon uh, the MAT, uh, which is the medical assistant uh, treatment and, yeah. and, and just uh, share with us uh, your knowledge as one yeah. of the top opioid so, experts so, in the nation. So before I start talking about medication and treatment, I wanna say that it's really, it's great that we are joining forces between uh, clinical staff and law enforcement. I mean, I think, I think that connection is seen as a no-no in some communities. I mean, they kind of hide from the law enforcement. And I just wanna mm -hmm. underline that we are in the fight together. And this is like, we should work like this, that we are in, a, in the same room, the same table, talking about the same topics. Because there are our communities. I mean, I'm a community psychiatrist, I'm an addiction psychiatry, but and my clinics are 
in the community. My patients walk to my clinics, right? They are part of the community, same as law enforcement are part of the community. I have law enforcement staff bringing patients to my offices, but they know I'm an advocate of that. And I feel part of the problem is sometimes we don't see that. Mm. And, and I know we have been talking about what the human piece is missing, right? We talk a lot about treatment, we talk about law medications, but we don't talk about the human piece on treatment, right? And that rapport, that relationship that you need to create with the community, law enforcement, and your doctors is really, really important. Um, well, medication for assisted treatment, that's how I, I add the four instead of medication assisted treatment, because it's, it's something that we don't call insulin the medication assisted treatment for diabetes, right? So it's like, it's, it's, it creates a mutual, it's a mutual conversation with the client, right? I'm not, I'm not imposing a treatment to the clients, you know, it's, it's he's deciding, he's a choice, right? And medication for assisted treatment has FDA approval, right? There are three medications when we talk about opioids, uh, and opioid includes the synthetic, the non-synthetic, the semi-synthetic, right? Usually when we think about opioid, we think about heroin, uh, but there are also oxycodone, Vicodin, Percocet, fentanyl, uh, you name them. There's a lot of them, morphine. Uh, so, and the fentanyl that is on the street is not the same fentanyl we see on the hospital. So don't confuse that, right? It's a fentanyl <laughs> that's coming from outside different countries. I mean, China, Mexico are the highest uh, importers of the of fentanyl in, on the street. And, and what we're seeing now is this fentanyl has become a drug of choice. Uh, in the past, 2013, 20, between 2013 and 2016, we were seeing a mix between heroin and fentanyl, making heroin a, a lot more cheaper uh, because of the mix. The fentanyl is a lot cheaper and more potent uh, than, than heroin. But now we're seeing as a medication, as a drug of choice, people's asking on the street for fentanyl. So they're injecting fentanyl because they want to inject fentanyl, not because it's a mistake which has increased the overdose rate, which is really bad because Narcan is really hard to block fentanyl because it's more potent. So you need something, you need more Narcan, naloxone, which is what our law enforcement carry around and have been um, ruling for, right? Um, and I, I, I'm a big advocate of, of law enforcement, nursing staff and paramedic having their Narcan and naloxone kits with them. So. Medication for assisted treatment, there are three options out there. There's methadone, there's buprenorphine, uh, people call it Suboxone, Subutex, because that's the brand name, but the medication name is buprenorphine. And there is a Vivitro or naloxone long injectable, right? Uh, and that's an injection that's given every four weeks. Um, so those are the three FDA approved. What that means is being shown to, you know, be helpful to uh, ma maintain someone on off of the street markets, off of, of the illicit substances, and keeping the structure that they need in society. Thank you, uh, Sheriff Fletcher. Well, first I want to compliment the doctor. I'll tell you what, that is just a great summary, doctor, of what's taking place in the community. And, uh, you know, thank you for that, for that uh, highlight of all the key issues. Um, on the community side, we're seeing more people dying from overdose of opioids in this country than we are from car accidents. It's been growing since 2008, this epidemic. Um, my son, of course, as you know, passed away in 2015 as this epidemic was growing. I watched him uh, fight the battles with uh, heroin, uh, then prescription drugs, of course. Um, he wasn't around during the fentanyl surge, but doctor, you've correctly pointed out that fentanyl has become uh, a huge uh, problem for us. Um, Suboxone wasn't readily available back in, um, you know, the early 2010 era. Their doctors were limited by how much they could prescribe. My son, um, to his credit, he didn't, no one wants to be a drug addict. Worked hard to try to find a doctor that could prescribe it to him and in, in time uh, did, and originally it was just for three weeks at a crack, and then in time he found a doctor that could prescribe it to him. Um, he tried methadone as well. Vivitrol wasn't really available then, but we use it in the jail at the sheriff's office now, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're proud to be trying to help people with their addiction. Um, but the community impact is dramatic. I did bring along uh, an Narcan. I will tell you I carry two of these in my car, but you're right, doctor, that 
nowadays we're giving three doses sometimes for people that are that are on fentanyl or high dose but i've seen uh, many people saved the only reason that the numbers of deaths have really plateaued or dropped is because the ready ready available narcan mm -hmm. and so in terms of use and serious use of opioids it's still increasing dramatically and as the doctor knows um, there's a close connection between people that are self-treating themselves for depression, anxiety, and other types of medical, you know, I'll call them mental health issues. And so, you know, in my son's case, he was trying to self-medicate himself. And I, I, I do want to say that uh, through the use of Suboxone, my child was very successful and eventually beat, beat the addiction. But for those that are out there, you never really beat the addiction. Mm. You always have it. And on his 26th birthday, um, some kids brought some drugs to his birthday party, and uh, he used them. And of course, there there was no one around with Narcan. There were people that were afraid to call the police because of uh, you know afraid they'd be in trouble for having the drugs there. So the medics were slowed in getting there. And by the time they got there, uh, he was in a coma, um, and then passed five days later. But uh, this story that I'm mentioning has been repeated thousands of times. I have a good friend that worked in the jail that uh, was under a lot of stress. He was using fentanyl. He passed away as well. Everybody knows someone. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're partnering with Teen Challenge to, uh, in terms of education, know the truth, getting information out there. And I know that does work because we did it with, meth with methamphetamine when that was a problem. But I want to throw this back to the doctor because I, in case they have to go, and I, this is one of the smartest men I've heard. <laughs> so, doctor, uh, any comments back? Yes, he is. <laughs> no, you, you, you're right, right? And, and it's, it's not, so just to make clear, Narcan and Naloxone are not treatment, right? They do is, is, is save the patient, give you a, a time, a window, right, to call for help. Yes. Give you a window, I mean, it depends how much opioid he has been using or she has been using, they give you a window from probably a few minutes to maybe 20 minutes, no more than that. But you need to call for help because the, the patient will go back to the coma or to the respiratory depression. Oh, treatment are the methadone, the buprenorphine, the Naloc, the the, the Vivitrol, the Natroxone, and you're right. I mean, only one out of four or five people that meet the criteria for a opioid disorder get treatment. It's really hard to find someone to treat uh, and has the empathy, right, the human feeling to treat this. Because it's not only take the patient away, also the family, mm -hmm. also the people around you, like the job, the physical. Uh, difficulties the patient has, and you're right. Usually, 60 to 70 percent of the patients that show up a depression, an anxiety disorder, preceded the use of the of, of drugs. Right. Um, so usually, present uh, depression is not treated. They start self-medicating because life continues. You know, I wanna, I wanna just keep going. This is nothing. Uh, stigma of looking for help, asking for help, still there, and they find something that makes them feel better. But that's something, become a, it becomes a problem pretty fast, right? And then money is not enough, and then we get into the illicit drugs, heroin cheaper, and you know the story. I mean, we have seen that many, many times. I think is we need to teach, I'm, I'm an advocate of going to schools, uh, early age, I mean, it has to be, uh, elementary school if possible, mm -hmm. talking about mental health, uh, training our staff in schools about how to identify, right, signs and symptoms of depression before they, they become a disorder, right? Because not all depression is clinical depression. I mean, it's okay to be sad. It's, called, it's okay to feel emotions because you're human, right? We need to feel emotions. But once it's a clinical depression, you are losing functionality, the kid is not himself, behavior has been changed, mm -hmm. family is distorted, we need to look for help. And we're so afraid of telling I'm depressed, so afraid of identifying that I'm weak, that the society is suffering. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's- Doctor, let me, oh, let me jump in, uh, uh, Chief and Doctor, I've got to leave in a couple of minutes, but uh, I just want to echo what you said, Chief, about how important uh, having this expert 
uh, analysis from Dr. Colon Rivera is and how important this conversation, Chief, thank you so much for telling that story again and again because it's eye-opening and it's affirming that this is illness we're dealing with and it's not bad people. And too often our society has demonized and called people weak or had people believe and feel shame where they actually needed help because there was illness that they were coping with. So that's where I want to also praise my colleague Carmen and both Carmen's because you all are on a mission to de-stigmatize the discussion about health and mental health so that our people can speak freely about what it is to be challenged and to also find a path to embracing resources, advice, counsel that will make us well and functional in community and removing the fear that is associated with people who have used opioids or drugs as a coping mechanism and the fear that keeps them locked in those behaviors because they feel so alone. But I want to say thanks to all of you. I have to leave for another session and compliment you for what you've organized and what we are doing together. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having Gracias. us. Gracias. Thanks for having us. Please go on, Sheriff. Well, um, no, I, I was just going to compliment what the doctor was talking about, but I want to throw it back to Carmen because some boots, boots on the ground mm -hmm. here. What we're trying to do is educate people, convince them that treatment is okay, get them the right treatment. And in the COVID environment, it's probably one of the toughest things you can try to do. A lot of things have fallen by the wayside. We've seen a dramatic increase in suicides throughout this country during COVID. Um, I've never seen anything like it in the summer. Usually we January or February, we have a large number of, of suicides, but we're having people that are mm -hmm. attempting suicide on a, on a regular basis. And a lot of it is mental health, mm -hmm. it's chemical addiction. And so you know, there's greater need now than ever. And of course, the economic issues and the social issues are, are not there. But Carmen, you want to talk a little bit about some of your efforts? I do. Um, like the sheriff said, that COVID-19 really did a different jump for us that we had to actually um, figure out well, what are the next steps we're going to do because obviously you couldn't go out and do the uh, conferences. Um, people that were doing the boots on the ground, we had to figure out do, Zoom all of a sudden came about into our lives and okay now we can do these conferences via Zoom and educate ourselves. Um, Carmen Robles and I, we were going to host a Cinco de Mayo symposium that ended up being because of COVID-19 we had to create a way of getting out to the communities. Um, she made some masks. She had me come pick the masks up with some brochures um, that I found in, in resource information of digging through the internet websites. Um, took those masks out and the brochures that had a lot to do with the uh, recovery of addiction, just talking about what the addiction disease is. And um, bilingual. Was, yeah, bilingual at that. And it was, it was different. Um, went to a couple of spots that everybody was masked up and wondering, what are you doing here? I mean, <laughs> it, it was an, it, enlightening to see that during a time of a pandemic, we could still figure out how to go out and help others in the community. Um, it also gave me a chance to work with uh, Minnesota Recovery Connections. Uh, they are a peer-to-peer -peer group that have been through the uh, disease of addiction. And we're actually working with them in a lot of different formats of hoping eventually we'll get them into uh, the incarceration part of the jail system um, because what I found out is that peer-to-peer -peer connection is more engaging and it opens people up to conversations. Um, there is that stigmatism of shame. It's been there for years. Um, and for me, I got into doing what I'm doing because of my loved one that has fought for over 12 years and he is now in recovery, but you see it all over the place and you just don't think it's gonna hit your home. And it was in my home. And I was afraid a lot of times that I would get that phone call. Mm -hmm. But he's made it through and it really pushed me to do what I'm doing today. And I'm honored to be a part of what I'm doing. Um, 
humbled by the uh, conversations I've heard with people who are struggling with the recovery, but it's great. It's great work. Thank you. Doctor, maybe you, we can just talk a minute about, about how families should respond because mm -hmm. I know in my situation, that was the toughest, uh, mm -hmm. trying to figure out, do I try to control the behavior? Um, you know, because there's a wide variety of other issues, thefts, et cetera, in order to feed the mm -hmm. habit that happened. And at some point, I finally, through going to classes, just decided to just keep loving him. Mm -hmm. just, okay. keep, just keep loving the... And I knew my son <laughs> wanted to get clean. Mm -hmm. So the question was, what was the best way to help? And, you know, certainly get, helping him get access to the right doctors and the right uh, chemical cocktail, if you will, was a key part of that. But what, what do you see in terms of your advice to family members in terms of the best way they can be supportive? Right, and that's not a difficult, I mean, that's a pretty difficult question. <laughs> I mean, it has a lot of moving parts and there are families and their families, right? Yep. Uh, usually we need to start with observing behaviors then talking about them and then referring. I always talk about those three steps, right? You need to observe, listen to your family member. I mean, uh, if you don't listen, you don't observe, you will never find out. Something is happening in front of us and we don't see it. Uh, so observing behavior changes, right? I mean, is, is, is she or he eating less? Is she or he is going to work, to school? Uh, any behavior, going to sleep later, waking up too late, uh, no talking on the table when he used, I mean, any, any, any behavior changes, right? Stopping uh, uh, anything that he used to like and now he doesn't do it. Um, you need to be really careful with that. And now we're spending, in the pandemic, we're spending more time with our family members mm -hmm. in school. There's homeschooling. So there is more opportunities now of observing right, those behaviors and talking about them. And then the stigma, right, that, oh, that doesn't happen to me and it will never happen to me, but until it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think verbalizing that and saying that it's okay <laughs> to talk about problems at home, I think that's a good start. Then there is the, the action, right? Are we, are we talking about that? Maybe the talking is not enough. Let's look for help, referring. Uh, there is national help, there's national hotlines. Uh, now there, I mean, with the increasing technology, there are uh, virtual meetings and, and, and now you can see a doctor through a, a phone, right? Because uh, the Ryan Hyde bill was eliminated, the waiver uh, uh, 300 something is, is, is allowing doctors to prescribe controlled substances through the internet before the pandemic, right? And through the emergency act, that's, that's possible before it was illegal to do it. Okay. Um, so now it's, it's, it's legal if you're in the same state. Uh, 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 so if I, if, if I was in Minnesota, even I was seven hours from you guys, I couldn't see your family member. Mm -hmm. um, so there are more options now in the pandemic. Probably there are a lot of movement and advocate, uh, people advocating to keep something similar to it. Might not be the same, uh, but something similar, maybe something hybrid. That, we'll see, that we will see the patient through computer, but also seeing the patient physically, maybe less time during the year. Uh, so something like that is what we're fighting in, in, the, in the federal law, because this is federal laws. Um, but, right, as you say, I think love and human interaction is what they need the most. Uh, but I think that human interaction needs to be something like you understand them, and it's really, really hard to understand a behavior like this because usually and often enough we see as a moral decision that got, as you had the option of stopping right we don't see it as a disease and if you don't understand that it's a disease it will be really hard to help your family member uh there is something called codependency uh, mm -hmm. something we mm -hmm. want to help them so much that we actually hurting them by helping their addiction, right? right. Uh, by giving them money, by things like that. But we feel so bad because they're our kids that we want to help. But we are creating a different dependency that they depend on you to depend on addiction. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be careful with that kind of transferring between family members and friends. Because, I mean, that could be, can fire back into other behaviors. But it's, there's no easy answers. Uh, I mean, yesterday I was uh, 
I have an interview with the New York Times about a situation like this, and they asked me what the solution was. And I was, the solution is that we need to work together. <laughs> the, the health system is not created for this epidemic. Uh, it's, we, we saw it's failing, it's failing us. The pandemic didn't happen, and we still have an epidemic of opioid happening mm -hmm. under a pandemic of, 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 of COVID of SARS-2, yeah. right? I mean, the system has not been created for our patients, and we're doing what we can, and family members, you know, we need to get out of this stigma uh, and, and talking between us. I know it's hard to talk about emotions, but we need to start talking between us. Doctor, can you just talk briefly about the trends you're seeing now? Because, you know, I know what started out with street heroin, little $25 mm -hmm. balloons that people were selling. A lot of it came from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then we went into a prescription drug where people were abusing prescription drugs that they would take out of their parents or grandparents cabinet and then of course fentanyl hit what's the latest trend in terms of percentage right, right. of usage so i mean you mentioned this started back on, on the on the 2000 but this actually started back in the 90s i well, mean we've been 60s. seeing this type of behavior <laughs> in the 90s yeah. right and, and and drug epidemic come by way right yeah, i mean yeah. there's no nothing that stay i mean cocaine in the 80s opiates in the 90s and through now uh, and we're we're seeing a wave of meth going up again uh and stimulants um, but yes, it started with prescriptions, right? And the back in the night is Purdue Pharmacy, Johnson & Johnson, all these big names uh, promoting, marketing a lot of the big, big pharma. MS Conti was a big one for, by Purdue Pharmacy. And they, they marketed as something that doesn't create dependency. So people just took it, right? I mean, they were taking it because I was in pain. Um, um, pain was a vital sign too back then, right? It was a, a vital sign as blood pressure is, as pulse is. So they were measuring your practice as how good you treat the pain. So if the patient surveys say that my, my doctor didn't treat my pain, because my pain still was seven out of 10, you don't get the reverse. So now the doctors are in a trap, right? I, I, I know, and I'm calling the doctor victims because we have a lot to do with this. Uh, but you're on a trap that you will not get paid if you don't, if you don't treat that pain. So what are you going to do? Well, you prescribe medication that they told you they don't create dependency. Mm -hmm. So it's just this twister and then the dealers come in and uh, you know, it's a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. um, then the oxycodone, because we started pulling back a little bit, they, and it's like, like demand and offer, right? Now we're talking about economics. Uh, we pull the pills out of the market and now heroin come in. I mean, it's cheaper, less doc, more, less docs start prescribing pills. So they are less on the street. So we are, we are less to sell. So we need to content and increase prices. And now we're putting heroin mm -hmm. and heroin cheaper. So people move from pills when they are more expensive to heroin. Then we did the same with the fentanyl, right? And now the fentanyl is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, but the quality is decreasing. It's more potent, less quality. Uh, so now we're creating in small labs that is contaminated with something else, uh, and it's not enough. So we are using benzos, benzodiazepines, uh, Xanax, clonopine, Valium, all those, to create a better high, to feel better, because the fentanyl is not enough. So now we, are, we have a mixture of drugs. Um, and then I feel so low, I need to use meth or use stimulant to feel better and continue with my day. So now we're talking about the on and off switch in, in this in this in these times, right? With a mixture of PCP and other smoking situations. Um, so I think the wave is moving out of the heroin, right? Uh, has been moved to the, the fentanyl, but we're seeing a decrease on the opioid use, and now we're seeing an increase on the stimulants use. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning that. We've seen a big increase in methamphetamine, and we sure. thought we had combated it and helped educate people. You know, back in the 90s, uh, late 90s, we really had some success like you're doing now in showing people the chemicals that go into methamphetamine, and mm -hmm. they'll look at those cans and, of, and they'll say, whoa, I don't want to put that in my body. Opioids are a little different because people are less afraid of what's going into their body because they've been putting those into their body. But one of the things we are seeing now is the price seems to be increasing now. I, I ran, you know, we, we run into addicts on a regular basis. 
And um, I'm not sure why the price is increasing, but the price of opioid uh, and fentanyl, good fentanyl, I guess what they would say, has, <laughs> has gone up. And so some of the meth use has come back, you know, as you say. Carmen? Wow, uh, thank you so much. This is such a... Uh such an incredible conversation. I look at my community in the Latino community and we don't have uh, the resources. We don't have to invent them, they're there. We just have to modify them so that we can accept them. And uh, building trust is the biggest thing in, in being able to help the community. And as I see Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, you're building that trust. Uh, when uh, CSO Moreno and I went to the west side, uh, this is a Latino type side of the neighborhood, Dr. Colon, um, there was a family who came out of the neighborhood house and the mom, the dad, and two little kids, and, and the mom said to the little girl, mija, esa la policía, es tu amiga. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and so uh, CSO Moreno looked around looking for the policia. She's like, where's the policia? And I'm like, well, you're the policia. And so she didn't even realize the power of that brown uniform. Or when we went to uh, Red Wing, Minnesota to drop off more resources in another county, uh, and, and, and the, the, the people at the restaurant were, were kind of like shaken up because they thought she was green guy and she was a police officer, and yet when they heard her speak Spanish, they were like, wow, you know, la policia. And so I think that's so important right. for us to be able to, especially now where, you know, we're not supposed to like you and don't want that. And, and, and I, I like it. I'm glad I'm in St. Paul because we have a <laughs> wonderful sport here. But I think that's part of that breaking the stigma. And, and being able to accept what you give us, then we believe you, and then we, because you're right, nobody wants to uh, you know, grow up to be uh, yeah. in this position. We did that with tobacco when we were working with uh, the Latino community in tobacco, show them what right. all the poisons that were in there, and all of a sudden they wanted to quit. So you're so right when you say, uh, you know, it's easier to take the pill, or, but it's, it's a different dynamic. Yeah. And, and so these conversations are so I just, important. I just want to mention that, I mean, law enforcement is really, I mean, it's part of the question, and we need to, you know, help you guys as well. I mean, patients on probation, for example, on court, drug court, I mean, they have an advantage that they have a, a better structure around them. Um, and some of the drug courts are, 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 are well organized. Some of them, depending on the county, are not that much. Uh, but the, the ones that are organized give the patient a more structure, right? You need to see your probation officer every, whatever, every week, every two weeks, depending on the county, and give some urine. So that's, a, that's, that's an extra motivator uh, for, the, for the patient to do better or for the person to do better. So um, I, I mean, I'm, 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 a big, I, I'm a big fan of uh, using the court system to help. Yeah. Uh, I arrested my own son twice. He was in drug court. It saved his life for mm -hmm. the five years of uh, normalcy that he had after his addiction. And if it hadn't been for the court system having a slight little hammer over his mm -hmm. behavior and control. So I, tell, I, I do tell people, keep loving them, identify, help them get treatment. But if they continue to, on this path, the best thing yeah, you can yeah. do is actually yeah. help them get back on the path by using the court system. So thank it's you so, for it's mentioning. So, you know, it's so true. It's so true. I have grandma calling me. I have bad news for you. My, 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 my grandson is in, in, in drug court and have a probation officer. I was like, it's like Christmas. <laughs> yeah. That's great news. There you go. You will see he will do better. So, I mean, we need to, we need to celebrate that sometimes. I, I think we miss, we miss the opportunities on doing that. Well, and I, I want to thank you for your work because she's right. We're not the most popular industry at the current time, law enforcement. We couldn't do it without the partnership we have with you and knocking down doors and walls and bringing mm -hmm. Carmen to the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it's not just that. It's the writings and the networking that you've, you've you. provided. So God bless you for the work that you're doing. And every immigrant community, every single one has had stumbling blocks and obstacles and and while this is affecting the Latino community, it's also right now affecting our Somali community. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. 100,000 Somali persons right here, and this is a huge problem. 
they're reaching out, they're desperate, and we're going to have to begin an initiative in the Somali community to meet with mothers and help educate them on what they can do as well. So we'll use you as the role model. <laughs> and the and we'll project. use you, Dr. Colonna. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's the beauty of what we're working with uh, Minnesota Recovery Connections right now because those folks are in recovery. They, they are coaching their peer-to-peer -peer system. And once we get, um, I guess, the dynamics of, of cultural folks that can go out to different communities and we can all speak the languages of what we're dealing with, there's where we're going to start mm -hmm. building up the communities again because it is all about if you're going to be, a, if you're going to work with the community, you have to be a part of the community. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really, right. when I did that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, training for that week, it was humbling um, just to talk to those who have struggled with life. Mm -hmm. You know, in watching my loved one, you know, I, I watched in front of me my grandchildren lose their families, home. Uh, the, the parents fell apart because of the disease of addiction. Um, work was done with it. They, they lost everything. Yeah. And it's the one thing that I learned going through this uh, coaching recovery was I always wanted to let my loved one know, darn it, bring it in here. This is what I'm trying to do for you. You're not yeah. listening to what I'm saying. Well, through the coaching <laughs> training, I learned it's that person's path. Yeah, you right. cannot guide their path. You have to let them do their right. path. Right. Yeah, she and took the important. old she took that's the old important. chancla approach. You know, I tried the old chancla. Yeah, no, that, that, that's <laughs> yeah. really important because when we're talking about medication and treatment, you need to you need to be personalized. And and I, I always present it as a menu of options more than this is your option because we we get in the trap that methadone is the only option that suboxone is the only option, that Bevitor is the only option, and that's not true. Right. I mean, people do well with only therapy, right? There's therapy that, that work. I mean, there's seeking safety for people with PTSD and, 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 and alcohol and, and opioid disorder, and that works. They keep, they keep track with no medication. But you need to sit down with the patient, understand the situation with the family, and make a treatment that's personalized. You need to meet the patient where they are at. If you push too much, you will lose them. Yeah, and let's talk about the possibilities because um, I know a number of people that have used methadone. Some people claim that methadone is actually better uh, than Suboxone. I was, I'm actually a big fan of Suboxone. Mm -hmm. Don't have much experience with Vivitrol, but what about, I mean, methadone sometimes is, of course, it's a liquid generally. Um, sometimes it's hard to access it on the weekend, so the pill is so much easier. Do you have any thoughts or recommendations on those treatments? Well, I mean, again, I, I always <laughs> present it as, as, as a menu, depending on the assessment I, I do with the patient and the families. Uh, they're all, I mean, depending on the patient, they're all gold standard. The gold standard is usually methadone yeah. uh, for people, I mean, they need the structure. Uh, it's been around since the 50s, 60s, has the most study behind it, more data. Uh, you know, it's, it's re less uh, people falling from, from treatment, so people stay longer on treatment. They call it the attrition rate. Uh, it's lower for methadone. Uh, I mean, they're both, people say that they abuse more methadone versus more buprenorphine than methadone, but that's not true. They're both abusable. I mean, you can uh, divert them. Yeah. I mean, you, you can take home and use it as you can, as you want, share them. So at that point, they're both there. Right? I mean, people, some people say, some data say that buprenorphine is more abusable than methadone. Some data say that's the opposite yeah. around. Um, so it's really hard to say which one is, is, is the best. Talking about data, scientific data, methadone is the gold standard. It's been around for longer, has the most data. Uh, buprenorphine is, I think, because it's newer and just point of clarification, right? Buprenorphine has been around since the 60s as well, but it was only approved for the opioid use disorder treatment in the, 20, in the 2002, but, it, but they, they, this study that is called the data 2002, and was approved for a waiver, you know, I'm, I'm getting angry. That's all right. <laughs> this is a long story of short, but you need a waiver to prescribe it because it's illegal to prescribe an opioid for opioid disorder in your office. Right. Only with the waiver, you can do that. That's right. why methadone is not a prescription, it's dispensed in a liquid form. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know how much time we have, but I want to reemphasize uh, that if you have a loved one, even if you don't, 
Um, people mm -hmm. should get some Narcan. They should carry it with them. I, I last, I think the expiration is usually a year or so. Um, carry it with your car. It comes in a box of two. Um, it, you, it's not a needle. All you have to do is push it into their nose when they've passed out. I'm going to ask the doctor to talk about the respiratory distress in a minute that's caused and how the brain works, but it's an amazing drug. I have seen people that look gray, blue, I would have sworn they're dead, and one or two doses of Narcan sprayed into their nose to brought them back to life. Usually if the first one doesn't work in two to three minutes, we administer a second one. But uh, and usually they wake up a little bit angry. Doctor, you can talk about that. But thousands of people's lives are being saved with this, and everyone should carry this with them. Doctor? Wow. Yeah, so Nordic and Naloxone are, they are anti-opioid medication, right? So they block opioid receptors so fast that you want to send someone in a withdrawal. That's why they hate you. Yeah. Um, so they feel sick. When you're withdrawing, you are sick. You feel stressed, you start sweating, you can have diarrhea, goosebumes, nasal, uh, I mean, you feel sick. It's, imagine having the, all the symptoms of a flu on top of you, like, as a, it, yeah, it's, it's awful. So they hate you, they will hate you, uh, they're confused. Um, so usually, this is my trick, right? Usually, and, and, and you need to be careful, right? Because not all patients on respiratory distress are opioid induced, right? Not yeah, right. all respiratory distress is opioid induced. So you need to try to talk to the patient first as if you were using CPR, right? It's, like, it's, like, it's the same technique of CPR. Hey, how are you doing? What's your name? But I'm looking for response. Um, if the patient is has no pulse, please start compressions. Okay, you need to start CPR. Okay, yeah. call for help because this is really important. We're talking about a patient is has no pulse. If we are sure that it's a respiratory depression, right, and the patient has pulse, and maybe you think you're in an area, you're thinking that maybe he's using opioid, Narcan is is great. But please tell the patient, hey. You're not responding, I'm gonna give you Narcan. Sometimes they wake up without you giving the Narcan, okay? Because they have been Narcan before and they remember, okay? And it's true, as has happened, I always do it. Hey, whatever, Juanito, I'm gonna give you Narcan now. Sometimes they respond and they wake up. Um, but yes, Narcan will send the patient on a withdrawal, right? And they will feel sick. Only the effect, only the effect lasts for about two to 20 minutes, give you enough time to call for help. If yeah. you feel the patient is going back to respiratory depression, give her more, give him or more Narcan. You are not gonna harm the patient by giving him or her Narcan, okay? So give more Narcan. They will hate you, they will hate you, they will feel sick, you will not kill them. They most, will die if you don't give them yeah. Narcan. Most times, you know, there'll be a friend there that might be able to tell you the type of drug so you can confirm they're on an opioid of some sort, or it might be a family member that's familiar with them. I will tell you that we've had in law enforcement, and here in Minnesota as well, we've had entire groups of people overdose at once. Mm -hmm. They'll get a bad or an extra strong batch of, of fentanyl, or maybe they thought it was just uh, heroin and it had, was laced with fentanyl. We've had entire houses go unconscious at once. In some right. cases, one person might be able to call 911. So it's, it's not unusual to see group, group overdoses as well. And, and, and you need to triage. I mean, in those moments you guys are trying to triage, uh, usually if, if they are an opioid, you should put them on their side, right? So they don't, they don't aspirate, right. uh, put them on the side or, or sit them down uh, and, and get this, the one that's, it's, you feel is it needs the treatment the fastest, um, but yeah, you can you can, you need to change the the way they're if they're laying down. You don't want them to swallow their own a vomit oh, or yeah. vomit because yeah. then they're gonna die. Um, so it's a difficult situation. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a difficult situation. So I hope you guys carry two, three, four of those things. Yeah, we do. Well, this has been fascinating for me to hear the doctor. Well, thank, thank you, thank you for bringing much. us all I've, together. I've been, we've been so anxious to get these two powerful no, leaders <laughs> together because we just talked about sharing and community. But I would like to ask one last question before we leave uh, Dr. Colón. So every once in a while I hear things like uh, public safety has nothing to do with public health. 
There are two different things. And so I feel that, that, that partnership is so vital and so important. And I, I just wondered uh, how you would respond to those who say, hey, public safety is public safety and public health is public health. And the two shall never meet. The twain shall never meet. So any comments on Sure, sure. I mean, it is, it, I mean, it's clear. I mean, we're living in a, in a, in a universe. I mean, this is, it's the year of the pandemic. It's the year of continuation of use of, of, of opioid, illicit drug, people dying from overdose. It's the year of the census, right? It's, it's like 2020 has blown my mind. It's like, <laughs> wow, we, we cannot have more. Because I don't Fires, know what, what yes. Uh -huh. um, but we, we always talk about social determinants of health, right? And social determinants of health are education, transportation, housing, and health, right? And all that needs to be in a balance. Without the public safety, those things cannot be balanced out. I Thank mean, we're you. still on the street. Uh, why people use, well, it could be because they feel depressed, because they're, they're isolation, because finances. I mean, you put that on context, right? You need no. the context to know where that pe where that person is, right? You need to meet up with the, where the patient is, where the client is. Um, but without the balance, right? Without the that community sense that have different moving parts, there is no no safe. There is no. I mean, and we can talk about racism. We can talk about everything that's going on, the violence that we're seeing. I mean, all that is a public health crisis. It's a public safety crisis. They walk together. Right. It's a domino Beautiful. effect. Yes. Well, and that's why Thank one of you. our goals at the Sheriff's Office, Carmen, is when people are arrested, when they come to our booking station, if they have a chemical addiction or a mental health issue, that is the primary reason they're there, we would like to have a diversion building right next door where they immediately go into treatment, some, some five-day treatment, some mental health counseling. They don't need to come into the jail if we can identify what the mm -hmm. causal issues are. And we, and we know that 70%, uh, we have three issues in our jail. 70% of the people are, have some mental illness that they're struggling with. 80% have chemical addiction or chemical abuse. And, and another 75% uh, have literacy issues. We're unable to read and succeed out in the community. So if we can work on those three issues, we can greatly reduce the population in our detention facilities. Okay. So that's that's a good definition of what public safety, public health is, right? I mean, it's 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 pretty hard because society usually punish mental health, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and you look for help, you're punished, right? They put you in a cell. Um, so we need to get to that balance. We need to shake hands and and, and make make a path and 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 be promoters promoters of that. Be mentors, coaches sponsors of that type of programs? Uh, yes, for, for myself, um, I think it's so important to connect the two mm -hmm. um, because um, we need that association and we need, um, I, I worry about my police officers uh, who, who have a job to serve and make sure I'm safe and yet they're, they're constantly involved in domestic or mental health issues or things that really put them at, at risk. And, and I'm thinking, well, gee, you know, that's where that public health needs to work together because uh, I, I don't want my safety, uh, uh, those who take care of me, to be in positions of danger because of that feeling that no, public health is public health and public safety is public safety. And so hearing you say that uh, just... Uh, gives me great, great strength and joy to continue the work and to let the community know, no, tú sabes, trabajamos todos juntos, somos una comunidad, y la policía está aquí para ayudarnos. So the, the police is here for a certain reason. Nobody, I don't believe officers get dressed in the morning ready to go kill anybody. I believe they're just like my son who goes to work every day, just like you, Dr. Colón, just like yourselves. And, and so these, all these issues and, and such a difficult time, unprecedented time in our history. Uh, so to hear the, the, the words about continuing that connection and, and really solidifying that connection uh, gives me a lot of hope 
for, uh, for us to be able to take care of business and to eradicate this uh, disease that's just eating us all up uh, right in the middle of a pandemic. And that increases domestic uh, violence at home. It increases alcohol use. Kids aren't going to school. They're missing their friends. And so it's just so much mental health trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma. And uh, thank you for saying that uh, we need to collaborate, connect, just exactly what the sheriff's been saying. That's why he got voted in, because that's exactly what he's doing with our community and with uh it sure wasn't my looks <laughs> wasn't my looks i know that <laughs> so uh dr colon again uh, my deepest gratitude i i speak on behalf of all of us here oh, in, thank you thank you i love this setting i love the setting <laughs> yeah. like we're, we are sharing the same table i love it <laughs> i wish i could give you a little bit of cafecito <laughs> pastelito <laughs> really, a, Actually, really I, I got i got the coffee so thank you for the coffee. <laughs> really an honor, an honor to meet you and talk with you thank you for your work of course no, I mean, Thank you Carmen, knows, Carmen, both Carmen know this. I, I, I always try to make the time needed for Yes, for, yes, for you do. Thank you. We need, we need, we need, I mean, we, we, yes. we can, we can make a lot of noise. Yes. But we need the action. We need our feet and our arms as well. So. Yes. And please know that you're embraced by us. And now that you know our sheriff and his passion and his commitment, I leave the two of you to uh, continue Thank you. this, Thank you. this sure, great sure. work and I, I appreciate it and I appreciate the audience for yeah. tuning in to Spin Station here, our number one public station uh, for our community in the, in the city of St. Paul, Ramsey County. And I encourage everyone to share this with friends and family so that we can have that compassion for our family and w we can stop that codependency uh, and not feel guilty because we did do something strong for our kid and made them whatever. And I've been there, I've done that. My kid didn't talk to me for seven years. And so I, I know the pain that you have to do when you see that y y someone you love is, is on the wrong track. Yeah. So I just want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart and especially Spin and McFarland. Yeah. Media. And it's not, not, it's not an easy conversation, right? But it's a conversation that it has to happen. And the more, the more you talk about it, the more people talk about it, the less stigmatized it is. So let's work on that. It's, it's sometimes more comfortable to be in denial, <laughs> but it's never, it's never good in the long run to be in denial. So of course. thank you. That's very true because um, just that shame of it, the more communications and open conversations we have, will start to erase, not, not that it, it'll start to dissolve that shame mm -hmm. and make people feel, have people feel more comfortable to yep. have these conversations mm -hmm. because to be comfortable, you have to be uncomfortable. Yes, so. well said. So with that- we'll, Thanks for having us. We'll close the day. And again, Dr. Colón, muchísimas gracias por toda su ayuda, por su mm -hmm. apoyo y este, no, we, we sinceramente. We are in this together, guys, so thank you for Yes, that. we are. <laughs> thank you. Dios te bendiga, and I'll see you soon. Muchísimas gracias. Take care. Gracias. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.